Welcome to Lecture 3, The Wonderful Wave. I mentioned in the first lecture and again in the previous lecture that light is a wave. It's an electromagnetic wave. Sound is another kind of wave. And there are many other kinds of waves. Waves on ocean water, waves that earthquakes send through the earth, and so forth. Um, what exactly is a wave? Um, we need to understand waves to understand most of the phenomena of optics, that is, of light. And we need to understand waves to understand many of the phenomena associated with sound, which are the topics of this first module. So what's a wave? Well, it's some kind of a disturbance. And it travels. It's clearly obvious. A storm occurs out in the middle of the ocean, and you're in bright blue skies at the beach. And nevertheless, big waves are washing up on the beach. There's a disturbance that's come from that storm out to sea. And it's carried with it something. But that something isn't matter. The ocean hasn't moved from the middle of the sea to the shore. The water hasn't moved. Something's moved, though, and that something is energy. So if I had to give a definition of a wave, a wave is a traveling disturbance, a disturbance that moves through space, and it carries with it energy, but it does not carry with it matter. Let me clarify that just a little bit. When I say it doesn't carry matter, it moves matter temporarily. The water in the ocean goes up and down as the water wave passes. In some kinds of waves, the medium, like sound waves, the, sat, the air goes back and forth. But the air does not move when I'm speaking from my mouth to your ear, for example. A traveling disturbance does, and it carries the energy that I imparted to the air, but it doesn't carry matter itself. Let's look at a couple of examples. Um, I have a little movie clip here in which we see a ball bobbing on ocean waves. Watch the ball. Um, sort of an optical illusion suggests the ball may be moving to the left, but it isn't. The wave is moving to the right. The ball is staying in exactly the same place. It's bobbing up and down on those waves. The same thing would happen for a boat or a buoy or something else of that sort. The wave is moving. The wave is carrying energy. The disturbance that the wave is constitutes that disturbance in the surface of the water, which would otherwise be flat in the absence of the wave. If you make any disturbance in the surface of water, that disturbance will propagate away, move away as a wave. It will carry with it the energy that you put in to make that disturbance, but it will not carry the water with it. Now, I have to com comment here a little bit. When you're standing by the beach and you see waves crashing on shore, uh, right as the wave is crashing on the beach and the bottom of the wave is dragging on the bottom, things are a little bit more complicated and water does actually come forward. But in bulk, when the wave is traveling in the open ocean or a sound wave is traveling through air or any other kind of wave is traveling through its medium, the medium is temporarily disturbed as the wave goes by, but the wave does not move the medium. So a wave is a traveling disturbance that carries energy but not matter. Give you another silly example of the wave of, of people in a stadium as they stand up and sweep around. That's a true example of a wave. The disturbance consists of the people removing themselves from their seated position, standing up and sitting down again. That disturbance clearly moves around the stadium. In a sense, it carries with it the energy that it takes to lift a person out of his or her seat, but it does not move the people around the stadium. So a wave is a, dis a traveling disturbance that, car that carries uh, energy, but it doesn't carry matter. And to talk about waves, we need to characterize waves by several other qualities that they have. First of all, they have what's called amplitude. Amplitude is simply how big is that disturbance? How high is that water wave? You turn on a marine forecast, and it will tell you they're expecting waves of two to three feet today. That's a measure of the wave amplitude. Um, here's a wave with small amplitude. Here's a wave with large amplitude. And by the way, whenever I talk about waves, I'm representing them as these uh, sort of wiggly patterns. They don't have to have that nice, smooth, sinusoidal shape, but many waves do, and it turns out mathematically simpler to talk about waves like that. That's why you'll always see physicists describing waves of that sort. Um, here's another example of a wave. I have here a machine that is designed to show a particular kind of wave. These are waves on a metallic system in which I have some metal rods connected by a thin wire, and a disturbance of one of these rods is communicated to the next one, and it does so with an amplitude that I set by setting the initial disturbance. By the way, before I demonstrate this, I want to thank the Pasco Company, which specializes in physics demonstration equipment and teaching equipment for lending uh, us a great many of the demonstrations that we're using in this video course. So thanks very much to Pasco for doing that. Um, here is their wave machine, transverse wave machine, and it consists, again, of these rods that are running this direction, the wave is going to propagate in this direction, and the disturbance is going to be a tilting of these rods from their horizontal position. So I'll start with a small amplitude wave, and I let go, and you see the wave propagating down, and in fact, you see it coming back. More on that later. I'll make a slightly bigger wave, changing the wave amplitude, and there it goes, coming back, slightly bigger, and there it goes, and there it comes back. 
So clearly something is moving back and forth on this wave machine, but that something aren't the metal rods. They're temporarily being disturbed from the position they'd like to be in, this nice horizontal position, but they themselves are not moving, except temporarily up and down as the wave goes. In fact, the direction they're moving, tilting up and down, is exactly right angles to the direction the wave is going. That doesn't have to be the case, but it is the case in this kind of wave. So a wave is a traveling disturbance. It carries energy, but it does not carry the matter that's being disturbed with it. It only temporarily disturbs that matter, and it does so with an amplitude, a size of that disturbance, which we could characterize there. It's a couple of inches. Pretty hard to stop a wave on this thing. It would really like to have waves traveling. There it is, slightly smaller disturbance. That's the amplitude of the disturbance. If I make one of these nice, smooth, wiggly waves, you can see there's a clear distance between the crests, the places where the wave is disturbed in the upward direction the most. Let's do that again. Okay, There's a clear distance between those. That's not a distance I have much choice about in this wave machine, um, set by how I choose to, how fast I choose to wiggle them and by the properties of the machine, by the, of, the, of the metal rods and the spring that's connecting them. If I wiggle them faster, that distance is a little shorter. That distance between wave crests is called the wavelength. So here's an example of a longer wavelength. Here's an example of a shorter wavelength. The wavelength is the distance between the wave crests. It has nothing to do with how big the wave is. I could have a big amplitude wave with a short wavelength, or a small amplitude wave with a long wavelength, or a big amplitude wave with a big wavelength. I could have all kinds of combinations. Wavelength and amplitude are essentially completely independent. Wavelength describes the distance in space between any two similar points, repeating points on the wave, typically between two crests of the wave. And the wavelength corresponds to some very real physical properties for some of the waves we're most familiar with. For sound wave, for example, higher pitched sounds correspond to shorter wavelengths. Um, lower pitched sounds correspond to longer wavelengths. For visible light, shorter wavelengths are bluer, longer wavelengths are redder. Infrared light that you can't even see has an even longer wavelength than red. Ultraviolet wavelength that you can't see either, but you can feel in causing a tan or a burn or worse skin cancer, uh, has a much shorter wavelength. X-rays have even shorter wavelengths still. Um, the wavelength of waves on this machine as I do this is a few inches, as you can see. That's the distance between crests. The wavelength of, of typical light waves is about half a millionth of a meter. There we are back to that half a millionth of a meter. Again, a millionth of a meter, as I showed last time, being a thousandth of the smallest distance you can see on a meter stick. And I showed you that in the last lecture. Um, so the wavelength of visible light is about a half a millionth of a meter or a little bit less. Um, it's no secret and no surprise and no coincidence that that's roughly the size of those pits we talked about last time on the CD. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later in this lecture. Um, another thing waves do is travel at a particular speed. Eh, it takes a second or two for that wave to get down, a couple of seconds. There it goes. I can't seem to change that. Wiggling the waves faster changes their wavelength, and I can make them have bigger amplitude, but it doesn't seem to change how long it takes them to get along this machine. Uh, waves have a particular speed, and that's determined by the properties of the medium they travel in. Uh, for a sound waves in air, it's about 300, actually 340 meters a second, um, about 700 miles an hour, about 1,000 feet per second. Uh, for light in air or vacuum, uh, it's about 300,000 kilometers a second, about 186,000 miles a second, a phenomenally rapid speed. And that's, by the way, the reason for the five-second rule you may know about thunderstorms. If you hear a thunderstorm, if you hear, if you see lightning flash, and then you count the number of seconds until you hear the thunder, you see the lightning flash. Lightning travels to you almost instantaneously because 186,000 miles a second is so fast that light from any lightning flash takes an imperceptibly tiny amount of time to reach you. But light from uh, sound from the thunder takes, it's traveling at about 1,000 feet per second, 340 meters per second, 1,000 feet per second. There's 5,000 feet roughly in a mile, so that's about a fifth of a mile a second. I said there was no math in this course. Well, here's a little bit. And so light travels at about, sound travels at about a fifth of a mile a second. And so it takes five seconds to go a mile. So when you count to every five seconds, you count between the time you see the lightning and hear the thunder represents one mile of travel time for the sound waves. Now, once we know about the speed of a wave and we also know about its uh, wavelength, we can find out something about its frequency, how rapidly it varies. And I want to say a little bit more about wavelengths, and then I'll move on to talk about uh, how we get frequencies from that. Um, so here are some typical wavelengths. Um, AM radio, 
the radio you listen to down at the AM end of the dial, uh, AM station at 1490 on your dial. Uh, well, that radio station has a wavelength something on the order of 300 meters or about 300 yards. That's a big, long distance between the wave crests of that AM radio wave. FM radio, it's about three meters. And it's no coincidence that if you hang up a little FM radio antenna in your house, it's on the order of one and a half meters long, about four feet or so. Um, that's about half a wavelength, and that's typically what antennas have to be. Uh, a microwave oven, got a microwave oven over here. The waves inside that that are cooking your food are electromagnetic waves, similar to radio waves and light waves, and they have a wavelength of about five inches, 12 centimeters roughly. Visible light, as I said, it's about half of a millionth of a meter, about a two thousandth the diameter of a human hair. And sound waves, because sound travels at a different speed from light, um, sound middle C is about 1.3 meters, about four feet. So typical sound waves that we hear every day have wavelengths on the order of feet to yards and so on. Um, once we know the wavelength, we can also figure out the frequency. Um, ask, if I stood at a fixed point here and asked how many of these waves went by every second, well, that depends on how fast they're going and what their wavelength is. And that frequency, that, that number, how many cycles of the wave go by me each second, how many wave crests pass me in a second, that's called the frequency. Um, and it's simply the inverse of the wave uh, uh, period, basically, of uh, the time it takes for one wave to pass you. And we can get that from the wave speed and the wave uh, length, but I'm not going to go into that because that's a little more mathematics. Um, wave frequency is measured in cycles per second. A cycle per second is also called a hertz. After Heinrich Hertz, who was the first person to generate and receive radio waves back in 1887, um, frequency of AM radio is about a million cycles per second. That's called a megahertz. Uh, the frequency of FM radio is about 100 million cycles per second, 100 megahertz. So 107.9 on your FM dial is 107.9 million vibrations of that radio wave every second. Um, visible light, the frequency is about 500 trillion cycles for every second. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. For sound, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the pitch. For electromagnetic waves, the shorter the wavelength, the more you go toward the visible and then be into the red, yellow, orange, yellow, blue, green, violet, ultraviolet, x-rays, and so on. Um, frequency and wavelength are basically inversely related for a wave of a given speed. By the way, that speed of sound, which I introduced as 1,000 feet per second or about 340 meters per second, about 700 miles an hour, is also not coincidentally about as fast as you go in a commercial jet airplane. You typically go a little slower, 550, 600, 620 maybe miles an hour. But uh, there are great technological difficulties, which I'll talk about in a later lecture, involved in going at speeds faster than sound. And consequently, uh, commercial aircraft are restricted to speeds a little less than, but close to, the speed of sound, which is about 700 miles an hour. Now, those are properties that characterize waves. All waves have some common behaviors, and understanding these common behaviors is going to help us to answer some of the questions we raised, for example, in the lecture on how CDs and DVDs work. First of all, waves reflect. They bounce off material surfaces. I'll give you one example with this wave machine. Um, this doesn't look like a material surface, but the point where the wave machine ends is a dramatic change in the material, just like the surface of a mirror is a dramatic change in the material, was air, and now it's suddenly shiny metal that a light wave is traveling through. And so at some kind of place where the material medium changes abruptly, waves reflect. And so I'm going to start a wave. It's going to travel down the wave machine. It's going to get to the end, and it's going to reflect and come back. It doesn't just die there. It doesn't just stop there. If it did, its energy would disappear. It doesn't stop. It turns around, and back it comes. So here it goes, reflection, and back it goes. There it goes, reflection, and back it goes. Um, reflection is happening all around us. You see light from light sources, the sun, light bulbs, whatever, that's reflected off other objects in your vicinity. The objects you usually look at aren't themselves sources of light. They're reflecting light from other sources, like light bulbs and the sun. Um, most of the objects we see, as I look around this room and I see the green walls or the tan window frames and so on, um, those are reflecting in what's called diffuse reflection. The surface is kind of rough. Now, you have to think a minute about what might I mean by rough. Well, by rough, I mean the surface roughness is much larger, in fact, than the wavelength of the light. And since the wavelength of light is half a millionth of a meter, um, a surface has to be pretty smooth to seem smooth for light. So that surface is rough. And so the reflection actually occurs at a lot of different angles. And I don't see a shiny reflection of what's somewhere else in the room off that particular surface. 
because it's rough, and that's called diffuse reflection. If we polish a surface very carefully, like a piece of glass with some metal coated on it or a very sh carefully shined piece of metal, um, we get the surface roughness down to something that's comparable to the wavelength of light, and then we get nice solid reflection off that reflection that can actually form images, and that's called specular reflection. Um, I remember once being taken to visit a large radio telescope at the University of Massachusetts when I was giving a talk there, and the radio telescope was made out of a uh, chicken wire fence they had bought from Sears Roebuck or something. It was very rough and crude. But it was a telescope that looked at wavelengths, radio wave wavelengths, that were several meters. And so it didn't matter if the thing was made of chicken wire and was rough. Rough or smooth are relative terms, and when we're talking about waves, they mean rough or smooth compared to the wavelength of a wave. And depending on whether we have rough or smooth surfaces, we get diffuse reflection that we don't see shiny images forming, or we get true specular reflection where we actually see the reflected light all coming off at the same angle it went in at and giving us an image. Um, sound waves also reflect, and the reflection properties of sound waves determine things like the acoustics of concert halls, how we build concert halls, where the music sounds good and you can hear it from every part of the room and it doesn't take forever for it to die off. On the other hand, it doesn't seem completely dead as though the sound's been absorbed without reflecting. So reflection is a very important property of waves. Um, and we've seen the reflection here with this wave machine. And the waves do something else. They refract. Um, refraction means... Most generally, they change direction when they enter new materials, um, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that they change speed as they enter a new material. So here's a wave that now, I've hooked a little piece of tape on here, and all it does is join the little end springs of these two wave machines together, so that when a wave goes down one machine, it's going to be coupled into the next machine. I've just put a little piece of duct tape on there. It isn't much of a coupling. It isn't very strong, but it's enough that when the disturbance that propagates down one of these pieces of wave machine hits the other one, it will go into the other wave machine. This shorter one, you'll notice, has shorter rods on its pieces here, and that determines some of the properties of the wave, in particular the speed. Um, these rods are lighter, and you might expect because they're lighter, they have less inertia. We'll talk about that in Module 2. And they respond more quickly. And so in this section of this machine where the, wave, where the rods are shorter, we're going to actually see the wave going faster. And then suddenly it's going to hit this new region. And watch for two things to happen when the wave hits this region where the rods are longer. First of all, some of the wave is going to go in to the region with the longer rods. Some of the energy is going to be transferred in. And the wave in that new medium is going to move more slowly. On the other hand, some of the information, some of the energy, and it could be carrying information also, is going to be reflected at this interface between the two regions. And that's a universal property of waves. And we're going to see it demonstrated for this machine. So here we go. Okay. See how much slower the wave is traveling in the second medium? That's the fundamental idea behind refraction, the bending of light as it passes from one medium to another. And over here, we have a demonstration that will show that more explicitly and show it in two dimensions where we can actually see the direction change. Okay, what I have here is a laser, small laser. It's pointing directly downward, and I have a transparent plastic block. These are both attached to this whiteboard, which has a metallic background, and they have magnetic strips on the back. So that's how I'm able to set this demonstration up. And right now, you see the laser beam shining straight down. That's analogous to the waves that were going on that wave machine. These are electromagnetic waves. Um, they're entering the block of plastic. You can't see it, but in fact, they're moving more slowly in the block of plastic, just like the waves on the wave machine were moving more slowly in the piece that had the longer rods. And finally, they emerge back into the air. Nothing magic here, and you can't see the slowing down. However, if I change the angle at which the light beam enters the plastic, you begin to see, if you look closely, a slight bending, a slight change in the direction of the light as it's moving through the plastic block, and then it changes back to its original direction as it emerges on the other side. As I make the angle more and more steep, that bending becomes more and more obvious. And you see something else beginning to occur. You see a slight reflection now beginning to occur at that surface. That was always happening, but it was a little difficult to see before. But now you begin to see that reflection. More and more of that is actually being reflected. And as I get down lower and lower, most of the light is being reflected, and rather little of it is being refracted into the plastic block. But some of it still is, and the angle change is now quite dramatic. By the way, you see this effect if you walk along in front of plate glass windows uh, in a big storefront or something. You look into the glass windows, and uh, stroking directly in, you don't see much. But looking at an oblique angle, you see reflections of all the things around you. So that's the phenomenon of refraction. 
why does refraction occur? Well, I've hinted that what's happening to the waves as they enter the new material is they've typically slowed down, or in the case of going from glass back to air, they've sped up. And so what happens is something like this. Here I've got a picture in which I show the crests of a light wave or other kind of wave approaching one of these interfaces between two media. Here it is, air to water or glass, for example, and it's light waves. And what happens is the waves move more slowly. It's a little bit like a marching band coming down the road, and if they want to turn the corner, the person on the inside of the corner actually marches more slowly or stops and walks in place while the others have a bigger circle to move, and that's what turns the direction of the marching band. The same thing happens here as the light waves hit the new medium and are going more slowly the direction changes, and that's what gives us ultimately this change of direction, this refraction that is occurring at these interfaces. Um, this should remind you a little bit of the picture I showed in the last lecture of the light entering the CD in a broad beam that then changed direction uh, as it entered the uh, refractive medium of the plastic of the CD. It's the same phenomenon. That's what allowed us to avoid some of those dust problems. So that's... Uh, something that light does, and we'll see in the next lecture how that's responsible for forming images and, le and letting us see. Well, light has two other properties, two other behaviors I'd like to discuss. Uh, first of all, light, unlike particles, can be in the same place at the same time. I recently taught a course with a colleague called the Dance of Physics, and we actually had our students choreographing a dance that illustrated this fundamental difference between waves and particles. Two waves can be in the same place at the same time, and two particles simply can't do that. They can't occupy the same space. So here's an example of a couple of waves, and if those two waves occupied the same space, they simply add together to make a bigger wave. On the other hand, if those... That's called constructive interference. On the other hand, if those two waves were initially out of step... So crests met troughs and troughs met crests. Then when those two waves combined, we'd have nothing. And that's called destructive interference. And for a moment, I'd like you to pause your DVD player or whatever you're watching this on, and I'd like you to think about the following question. Um, what if I had two waves that were in step? Suppose I wanted to delay them. How much time or distance would I have to delay them? Distance is probably a little easier to think about, so that they would then be out of step. Think about that question a minute, and then start your player up again. The answer is you would have to delay them exactly half a wavelength. That would put a crest where a trough had been and vice versa, and that would cause them to interfere destructively. And that gives us the answer to the question we raised in the last lecture about how it is that we actually read the information from a stamped, commercially stamped CD or DVD. Here's how we do it. We saw this picture last time. Um, we had the laser beam coming in. It's bouncing here off the edge of a pit. Um, it's coming in from the bottom edge of the CD. I haven't bothered to show the refraction that takes place at that edge. And it comes out, the reflected beams are out of step. How much out of step are they? That depends on how much further the one beam traveled than the other. We want them to be half a wavelength out of step in order for that reflected, uh, dis that reflection, the reflected beams to interfere with each other destructively. What does that mean? Well, one wave traveled further by the mount of the pit, the, the height of the pit, and then back again the height of the pit. So the in and out distance needs to be half a wavelength. That means the pit depth should be about a quarter of the wavelength. And in fact, that's approximately true. The, the pits are stamped to be about a quarter of a wavelength deep. The waves come out like that, um, essentially uh, out of step by half a wavelength. And as a result, when they combine, we get destructive interference, and that's what gives the dark spot on the pit. Now, this wave interference also explains those shiny rainbows we saw coming off the CD in the last lecture. Um, how does that happen? Uh, well, let's take a look in detail at what's going on here. Here's the disc. We turn the disc on its side. Remember, the disc has these tracks on which those pits are stamped, uh, these spiral tracks. If we turn the disc sideways and then take a blow-up across the disc, what we're seeing are the tracks sideways on edge like that. And those rainbows are coming from interference of light that's bouncing off those individual tracks. Let's see how that works. Okay. So here is some light coming in. It's hitting one of the pits. It's bouncing off. Uh, Blue light also coming in, hitting the next pit, bouncing off. Now, here's the issue. If we're heading up to a place near the upper right of this picture, the light that's hit the second pit over has had kind of a head start. It's closer. In fact, I've drawn a little line across here that indicates that there is a little bit of extra distance that the leftmost light beam has had to travel. There it is, emphasized. It's that little V-shaped extra distance. Now, we know about interference. We know that if the extra distance were half a wavelength, we would have destructive interference. But if it were a full wavelength, we would have constructive interference again, and that would cause those two waves to reinforce. So at that particular angle, this blue light would be reinforced by that constructive interference, and, of course, we're hitting many other uh, 
pit tracks as well. And so all in all, we would get constructive interference for blue light at this particular angle. On the other hand, if we had red light, which has a different wavelength, here's some red light coming in at a much shallower angle. Uh, again, if I look at the difference in distance, there it is. It's a much bigger difference this time, but that gives us constructive interference for the red light. Extra distance is a wavelength, and off we come with much more intense red light. Put that all together, blue and red, and we get red light coming off at one angle, blue light coming off at another angle, which is why when you view the CD at different angles, you see these rainbows and you see different colors emphasized. So that's where the rainbowing is coming in the disks. It's a clear giveaway that we're dealing with structures that are very small, comparable to the wavelength of light, and that this interference phenomenon is occurring. I'll give you another quick example about interference um, in a microwave oven like I have over here, um, we rotate the food because there would be interference between the microwaves whose wavelength is about four inches or five inches. Um, we rotate the food because otherwise some parts of the food would be at points where there's always destructive interference and it wouldn't cook. Finally, let me point out the very last property that light waves have, they diffract. Diffraction means that when light waves or other waves pass around objects, they change direction. And here my object is a gap in a barrier, an opaque barrier. And here come some waves in, and those waves go through, and they bend a bit at the edges of that barrier. And what comes out the other side looks something like that. Okay? Now, in this case, the object, the slit, the hole, the gap between the barriers, is large compared with the wavelength, and it gets quite well imaged. We see downstream from that what looks like a nice beam of light, and we can infer that it went through some kind of slit, and we can kind of measure the size of that slit. On the other hand, if that slit were very small, small compared with the wavelength, what happens when the light goes through is it just bends into circular arcs. You can see this for ocean waves passing between gaps in reefs, for example. You can see it for light waves passing through small slits. And we don't get an image. We can't infer much about that slit other than that it's small. And the fact is this. When an object is very small, comparable to or much smaller than the wavelength of the wave, we're trying to reflect off it or pass through it to understand it, to image it. We simply can't do that. You cannot look at things with light if the thing is smaller than the wavelength of light. That's why, for example, we've built electron microscopes that have smaller wavelengths than visible light for seeing certain kinds of objects. Um, so if an object is smaller than the wavelength, we can't very well image it by reflecting waves off it or passing waves through it. And that explains our other question about CDs and DVDs. Um, how is it that DVDs hold so much more information than CDs? The answer lies in a number of things, um, partly better technology for storing the information and so on, but in large part it has to do with a different laser wavelength. When CDs were invented, the only cheap small lasers that were available were in the infrared. Um, they had a wavelength of about 0.78 millionths of a meter, 780 nanometers. Um, later lasers became available. There were visible lasers in the red. These are the lasers used in DVDs. They're about 0.65 micrometers, 0.65 millionths of a meter. And the result is, uh, in a CD, we can get away with pits of a size about a millionth of a meter. In a DVD, we can make them quite a bit smaller and space them quite a bit closer together. And if you think your DVD player is the ultimate, you'll soon have a Blu-ray player, blue because it's a blue laser, with much shorter wavelength light, and therefore this so-called diffraction limit is much smaller, and we can actually image much smaller pits. So we can stamp the pits smaller, we can stamp them closer together, and we can put much more information on them. Uh, these use a blue laser. It's about 0.4 millionths of a meter, and these things hold about five times as much as a conventional DVD. Let me give you one other example of this diffraction limit. There are many in both technology and nature. This is one from nature or from sound, a couple of examples from sound. Um, uh, if you're in a building and somebody's playing loud music nearby, you probably hear the bass coming booming through. But you don't hear the high pitch noises. Why not? Because the bass wavelength is big and things like doorways and corners are, big, are, are small compared to the wavelength. And consequently, uh, you get diffraction around them. Uh, on the other hand, the shorter wavelengths, the higher notes diffract much less, and so you don't hear them. And a final example are bats. Um, why do bats emit sounds that we can't hear when they're looking for their prey? There's a very good reason. And a bat that evolved emitting sound like, I can make beep, 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 would never find an insect. Because beep, 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 beep sound is at a wavelength that's too long to image something as small as an insect. So here's a picture of a bat. The bat is emitting waves. I've drawn this correctly. The wavelength of the waves is shorter than the size of the insect. It has to be for the bat to be able to image the insect. And given that the speed of sound is about 700 miles an hour, that gives us uh, 
a, a wavelength for the waves that's smaller than the insect and therefore a frequency that's considerably higher than we can hear. So that's why bats emit high-pitched sounds that we can't even hear. If they didn't do that, they couldn't image the insects they're looking at. So those are a wide number of properties that waves exhibit, behaviors that waves have, and we'll use some of those behaviors in the next lecture to understand how it is that we actually form images in our eyes, in cameras, in telescopes, in microscopes, and so on.